kind of sort of pedagogical view of LB methods. And uh, I think the goal really is that for the lectures in the morning, uh, which are the rest of the week, even uh, but scientists don't take holidays. So these morning lectures, he'll, he'll will go to, for about 45 minutes, take a little break, maybe five, 10 minutes of coffee, and then come back. Um, and uh, you should feel free to, this is like a lecture course in the morning, so you could, should feel free to interrupt him and uh, ask for clarification and, and so forth, and uh, we'll let it go like that. Wednesday afternoon, tomorrow afternoon is a real seminar uh, in the regular slot that we usually have as astrophysics type of seminar at 1.30 um, tomorrow. And so that's more of a seminar. And, um, so with, without uh, further ado, thank you. And thank you so much, John. Uh, actually, uh, it is not true that you have to twist my arm. I'm very, very pleased and grateful to John. Actually, I've been many times in Scotland, but never here. <coughs> I'm very, very happy and proud to be here. And uh, as John said, but in the first place, I apologize. Uh, I cannot speak too loud. Uh, and I hope I can speak long enough for the lectures. Uh, that's why I'm wearing this heavy stuff. Um, so the, the lectures are intended basically as, uh, as background material. Uh, but of course, since I'm here for the week, I will be more than happy to take detailed questions or in fact, uh, uh, question related eventually to your own research projects uh, offline. Uh, each time I try to make the course a little bit more, um, I would say, more advanced, it becomes very technical and obscure. It's still not a good idea. And as John said, I really welcome questions on the fly. I don't like to speak for too long on myself, so please don't be uh, afraid to ask any kind of question which may turn out to be too long. And thanks a lot for this beautiful picture, which I will keep using for the future, for sure. Now, uh, uh, let's begin with a little bit of philosophy. Uh, Lapis Bolso was meant to solve macroscopic effects. Okay? I give for granted that you know a little bit of kinetic theory. If you don't, I hope I will be nevertheless minimal but self-contained in this lecture. But if you please not, not understand or something is please stop me and ask. So now, since we are here in the physics building, I don't need to explain much about the hierarchy which brings from, forget about quantum for these lectures, from Newtonian equation of motion to particles, and we found the effect of some potential, all the way up to the microscopic world of continuum fields. And this is Mr. Stokes, and this is Mr. Navier. Sometimes this is a test for the students with Stokes with Navier. Do you know? Okay. I already told you. But in the early days, I would confuse myself. Boltzmann is Boltzmann, no question. And Newton is Newton, the rest of the question. So this uh, uh, flow of information from molecules all the way to fields, and particularly fluid velocity and pressure, etc., is uh, intuitive, but if you want to be rigorous mathematically, it's not that easy. I'm not going to be rigorous at all. Okay. Um, the, point that, the only point I want to make is that there were people back in 20 years ago, 86, who were crazy enough to try to solve this equation, the equation of various Stokes, equation of fluid dynamics, okay, using methods which were basically belonging to this level. That sounds like insane, of course, because you don't want to design a Ferrari by computing the trajectory of every molecule of air molecule around the Ferrari. But they were smart enough to design particle methods which were so drastically simplified that they could have been put on a computer and eventually solve this equation more efficiently than using that we call it standard methods like finite volumes, finite elements, all we know from numerical mathematics. Okay? It's a crazy adventure, a fascinating one, and I would like to give you a little bit of flavor of that. <coughs> you might know that Feynman had a statement according to which, if you have a decent piece of theory, there should be at least three independent ways of deriving this theory. And I would say the Lapis Boltzmann is passing the Feynman test because. I can see at least three independent ways of deriving Lapis Boltzmann. The first one is what I call the physicist path. You start, as I said, from a Lapis analog of the equation. I'm going to give you some practical advantage. And uh, you go through the machinery of statistical physics, what you find in textbooks. And 
on the, on the way to Maria Stokes, you find, of course, Lapis Bolton. Historically, this is fun. People wrote down Lapis Bolton without recognizing it in a way. They wrote down Lapis Bolton just because they wanted to prove that you can go from the Newtonian Lapis gas to Maria Stokes, but they somehow overlooked it as a computational thing. So that's, in my opinion, the most scenic route to Lapis Bolton. But <coughs> some other people prefer later on, some 10 years later, people realize that you can derive Lapis Boltzmann straight away from, as a discretization of the Boltzmann equation. And that, that apparently is very popular with the mathematicians and applied engineers. I didn't like the shortcut at all in the early days. I now must recognize there is some value to it, but in my opinion, if you take the shortcut, it is a lot of the landscape. So, during this lecture, I will try to stick to the statistical mechanics rule. And there is a third way for which we are, in fact, responsible, as John said in Rome. We did, at some point, some reverse engineering and designed, in fact, Gladys Boltzmann, top down according to the prescription that it should reproduce Nelly Stokes in the long uh, wavelength limit. So these three ways are somehow independent, but they all lead to the very same Lapis Boltzmann equation. So let's begin with the Lapis Gas, very famous paper, Friction of Lapis Gamoy 6. And if I'm allowed with some uh, historical anecdote in between, I will give you a few. This Wolfram is Wolfram, he's mathematical Wolfram, the super rich. Uh, and uh, back some 10 years ago, we invited him in one of our annual conferences, and I would expect the guy to show up with an helicopter, give the corporate speech, and disappear with the same helicopter. No, he spent a full afternoon telling us why he had priority on this paper. <laughs> and it was really an interesting story. But for the record, officially, the credit was to Fischer, Black, and Pomo, we did the following thing. Now, Suppose we have a plane, we want to do a two-dimensional fluid, and we, test, we do a tessellation of the plane with hexagons. Okay? Now, on each point of this hexagon, regular hexagon, we put up to six, or in fact seven particles, including particles which just stand up. It looks like they are doing nothing, but they are very important. When I say that there is, for instance, and let me number the particles, one, two, three, four, five, six, and zero. So I put the six links along the line. And if I say that this is link two, I have an occupation number, and which is just a good number. Zero if there is no particle, and one if there is one particle. So in this case, for instance, n two will be one, because I have a green particle pointing uh, northeast, and n three northwest will be zero. Okay? So I can characterize the state of my system on each lattice side with a string of seven bits. Okay, and if the string is empty, the string is just seven zeros, means that I have an empty side, and if the string is full, I will have six arrows pointing along the six direction, plus the rest part. Of course, I have all the possible config configuration in between. So this configures a Boolean system because a seven bit word will characterize the state of my system side by side. Okay? Fair enough. So what? Then you have to give <coughs> some dynamics to the system. And the dynamic you, they, they gave, which is like a more, is very simple in words. Uh, it's a stream and collide dynamics, which is typical, in fact, of kinetic theory. So the streaming step is very simple. Consider the state of uh, time t minus 1, the dark blue here, and assume that I have a particle, for instance, on this side and on this side pointing along this direction. These are automata. They don't think. They are blind. So they are programmed to do just one simple thing. If I'm an automaton moving leftwards and blinded, and when the tick comes, I do that. No thinking whatsoever. If I'm an automaton programmed to move backwards, when the tick comes, and this way, no thinking. So the best of the streaming is, if I have an occupation number at position x and time t, at the next end along direction i, at time t plus 1, it has to be next plus c sub i. And c sub i just labels the That's just free stream, no forces now. Okay? Okay, fair enough. This is not yet a fluid, not at all. In order to be fluid, there is something has to happen when the particles come together. So if I have the two arrows, blue arrows here, 10 p minus 1, a tick 
times the Russian army will be sitting head on on this side, as you can see from the picture. Then they have to talk to each other, they have to do something sensible. Otherwise, they will just pass through, and that is definitely not, not a fluid. This interaction is called into a collision operator. C sub i means the change in the occupation number i due to the collision, <coughs> with all other particles sitting on the very same side. That's very important. The interaction is completely local. They don't look around. Okay? No potential energy, nothing. This collision operator, in principle, should encode all possible interaction between the particles. And the magic achievement, which is not trivial at all, is that they could write in fact, this collision operator in such a way that the Boolean nature of the scheme was preserved. This number can be either minus one. If you're familiar with the second quantization, it's very simple. You destroy a particle, you just leave things unchanged, zero, or you generate a particle. It's just the, the generation annihilation operator in the condensed matter. Okay? So you can write the collisions between these pseudo particles in such a way that the Boolean nature of the game is preserved. That's ideal. But I can give you an example. Let me give you an example of a very simple collision. So we have particle. That's a bit confusing. One, because it's moving rightwards. Even though it's sitting on the left side, one means rightwards. And this is particle four, because it's moving west. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, this could be a nice assignment for you. I can build a Boolean expression, which is a fourth order polynomial. So in principle, it's not that an easy thing. And this expression will be one, if it's possible will be zero if it is not possible. Now, let's check the example. What I want to perform here is a collision where particles one and four go head on and they scatter out, rotated by over six. That's a collision, right? They exchange mass, momentum, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. In order for this to be possible, I have to, uh, uh, there are several conditions. But one condition is that the out scattering channels, so say, two and four be empty, because there cannot be two particles in the same state. In the early days, these were fermions. Zero, one means that they can only have either no particle or one particle. They cannot have, have two particles in the same state. So if you now take this Boolean expression, this means that there has to be a particle in state one, so n1 will be one, n4 will be one, so one by one is the one, n hat means the negation of n2. So n, the side 2 has to be empty. So it's 1 minus n2 will be again 1 because n2 is 0. And n5 again has to be empty. So that this, four, this fourth order polynomial will be n, 1 in the end. Forget about this is a frequency factor, doesn't matter. So if you write down this expression, this expression will be 1 only and only if you have such an in scattering configuration and out scattering. And of course, you can write the very same thing for the inverse. So you would just reverse the side of the curve. So that's just an example of one <coughs> of the many expressions which contribute to the collision operator. Okay? And so Fischer's like a law could show, in fact, that by combining several of these, it is a partial list. That's the collision that I was showing you. Again, there is a little bit of a problem with the convention because I show you that these are two particles I don't, but the left arrow should be here, and the right, sorry, the right pointing arrow should be here, and the left pointing arrow should be here, but that what it means is just the same. Add on collision, you can scatter this way, you can scatter this way. So there is no unique out scattering situation. There are also more complicated collisions, like a three body collision like this. And there are even four body collisions. Okay? So you have a list of possible collisions, but for each of these collisions, you can build an operator similar to the one I showed you. And this operator will be just one if the collision is allowed, and then zero if it is forbidden. Okay? So it looks like a wallpaper game, and I remember in the early days, a person, a famous person who was heavily involved with this in the early days was Michel Henault. 
you know, hides a tractor. And he was very, very keen on not being told that this is a wall paper game. You know, the reasons for the cellular automata are kind of mimicking the real life, but when you try to be serious and quantitative, no. Okay? I think in a way it is still true, and he was very making really a point to call this lattice gas cellular automata because it didn't want any confusion. And it is the theory which has been developed out of this game is pretty serious and pretty uh, rigorous. Um, I'm not going to show you the details because this would be a full course, but let me never, nevertheless give you the, the flame. Any question at this point? I have a question. Please. What uh, are the collisions are considered? I'm like, the, pardon? Uh, like, how many particles, like, was there any upper limit that you'd only consider, like, three particles colliding, up to three particles colliding or four particles colliding? That's a very good point. Um, I'm not sure that is life to respect the point, but let me move forward. You are already anticipating one very important point. If I am in a real world, okay. for those of you who took some course in kinetic theory, you know that if I have an interaction potential, I have two particles coming like that, okay, the blue ones, and this distance between from here to here is called impact parameter. You know that. Now, depending on the input parameter and on the shape of the potential, you will be scattered by an angle theta, which is a continuous function of this separation. And this angle can be anything between <coughs> 0 and 5 in real life. Would you expect such a thing to happen in a lattice? I'm turning the question back on you. Would you expect that in a lattice I can have a scattering angle which is anything between 0 and 5? Certainly not. <coughs> How could we possibly expect to have a scattering angle of 32.5 degrees that doesn't exist? So now you see that there is a very limited number of configurations which are liable to collision. Liable to collision means what? It means that if you want the wall, this game to be a serious game for fluids, can give up the details of the potential, you don't care a minute, whether it's Leonard Jones or 612 or whatever. You do care though about making sure that the number of the mass of the particle is conserved, the momentum is conserved, and eventually the energy is conserved. If you look into any of these collisions, can you tell me how many particles we have prior to the collision? Two. Same thing, huh? This is prior and after. What is the momentum of this configuration? And again, turning back to the zero. I mean, the zero. Went to zero. Minus one here, plus one here. And same thing here. It's not minus one plus one, it's square root three or two, whatever, but it's still zero and same here. And if you go to more complicated collisions, same thing. So that's already the basic, very basic <coughs> point. You give up the details because these are just very few of all the possible collisions that take place in Newtonian dynamics. Remember the first slide I told you this is a cartoon for Newtonian mechanics, but it's a realistic cartoon. Please. Uh, if I want to conserve momentum, I can also get the original state back. That would not count. Because that would mean the particles just go through to each other, they don't exchange anything. So that would be a free bunch of particles, free stream, no fluid. That would be an infinite kinks and now. The particles just free stream. And of course, I can't distinguish between particles, but in general, no, they could cannot. also come like this and return back. No, 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 you cannot. This is really like uh, Fermi statistics. These are states. They, I mean, I use the terminology particles, but these are occupation now for a given state. So if I revert the sign, I don't do anything. The dynamically, this is nothing. In that sense, it's almost like a quantum system. Okay? The point I want to make is that. So, how many configurations do I have on this lattice? Let me ask you. Can I ask you? How many possible configurations do I have here? I mean, I take a point, I told you that I, have, I can't characterize, let's forget about the rest part. Six. Six. But the, the phase space, how many, how, if I have a string of six bits, how many states can I generate? Two 
power 6. Because let's do it, let's do it simple. If I have a grid like this with four states, I will get 0, 0, 0 up to 1, 1, 1, 1. If you count all the possible combinations, they are to the power 4. Because right? each bit is 0, 1, and we have 4, so 2 power 4. But here I am in principle 36, 6 power 2, 2 power, sorry, 2 power 6. Uh, 2 power 6, which means 64 possible configuration. Do I have 64 possible collision? Not at all. Much of the phase space of the lattice gas is just empty for collisions. That's a very bad thing. I'm anticipating a lot, but since you asked the question. If I remember correctly, Don told on me, it, it's in my book, but I don't remember that. I think only 16 out of 64 are liable to collision. So you lose a lot of collision now. What does that mean? Let's move a big step forward. Everybody's familiar with the Reynolds number in this audience. Who is not? Everybody knows that. Very good. So the Reynolds number is microscopic fluid velocity, microscopic size of a car, the size of the car moving at speed u and me is the kinematic viscosity. Now, if I want to make turbulence, okay, I want a huge Reynolds number, 10 to 6, 10 to 7. And typically, I want a very small viscosity. Right? So, small viscosity, again for the student, what does it mean? Many collision or few collisions? What? These are very basic things, but it's very easy to get confused. If I want a low viscous system, do I have to collide a lot or do I have to collide very little? You have to collide a lot because, very good, because the, the viscosity, the dimension of it, is this one. It's a length times the velocity. Okay? Take now the velocity of the molecules is typically the thermal speed. Okay? And this length is the mean free path, which is the distance that the molecule travels before colliding with another molecule. So if I want small viscosity, I want small mean free path, I want a lot of collisions. And I cannot do that here. Many configurations just cannot collide because I'm in a cage. These things surfaced quite neatly years later with the fact that this scheme was not able to produce large enough Reynolds number, and it was a big pain in the neck. The reason is precisely tracing to your question. Many in the lattice, you cannot afford too many collisions because you put yourself in a cage to save a lot of simplicity, but the cage is asking for a price, and one of the prices is that if you want to conserve mass and mental energy, which you cannot pass out, I mean, if you don't, you don't, then you do work it beautiful pictures, but not with that. Then you cannot collect too much. And the scheme, in the end, will have very low Reynolds number. That was a very serious problem. I'm sure. But let's go on with the... Well, now I have to become slightly more formal. I hope you don't mind. I will try to be as simple as possible. Nevertheless. So now, how did people do the serious job? How did they show that this little game would, in fact, produce <coughs> Serious to their eyes. <coughs> and this is Frisch, uh, Homo, a group of French, basically, this was done in France. <coughs> Again, in the mid 80s. First thing they did is said, okay, we have the rotation numbers, we have to go to the fluids, so we have to walk up in the hierarchy, and we have to go through an intermediate step, which is both. So F sub i is the probability of finding a particle moving along the link i, but it's no longer an occupation number. Probability means any number between 0 and 1. It's just like taking this, uh, say, average mean time and sequence of bit, which can be 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, and then you take the average, it may be 0.55. Okay? So this is an occupation number. This is sharp. This is like a trajectory. Either you have a particle or you don't have it. 0, 1, black and white. This is greater. This is probability of finding a particle on the given thing. And this probability is described by a Boltzmann equation in the lattice. 
uh, I don't uh, ask you to agree with this equation, just take it for granted. Uh, we'll, we'll come very much on that later on. So what they wrote, they wrote an equation which looks exactly like the Boolean automaton, so this is a crystal, very same thing. And this is the collision operator with the probability distribution instead of the occupation. Why do I need that? Well, because according to genetic the theory, once I have the probability distribution, I can construct the density of the fluid. <coughs> what do I do? If I'm at a point x given time, I just have probability, say, 0.3 <coughs> of having a particle moving right, 0.5 of moving the direction. If I sum up over all possible directions, it's just like the continuum kinetic theory integrating the Boltzmann distribution in velocity space, and this by definition gives me the number of particles, fluid particles around position x and time t, and if I put the mass, I will have the mass down. Okay? So that is a fluid quantity. And if I wait, the particle velocity, the mass is always one. So this is the momentum. If I put mass here, it will be mc. C is a discrete particle. I labels the velocities, and A labels the space, x, y, z. So this is a vector. Okay? It's the ith vector, but it's also the momentum. And so when I average the particle momentum over the probability, what I get is the density times the fluid velocity. This is the nervous stokes fluid. I mean, that's the time. And of course, since I can have this theory, I can construct many more. And there is a second one <coughs> which is a little bit more exotic. Uh, this is called momentum flux tensor. Why? Because I have momentum, CIA. And then I'm moving the momentum, say, momentum along direction A. So if I have a particle with this velocity, it can move along direction Y. So this is momentum flux. This quantity is key to the dynamics because it's a little bit more sophisticated, but the equilibrium part, I will, I will comment on that uh, more in detail, will generate the advection term in the Navier-Stokes equation and the fraction, rho times two the fraction. Do you recognize Navier-Stokes in this expression? Because that's not obvious. Um, I refer here to Navier-Stokes in this form, for the velocity, dt u a, Plus dB, uh, let's make it, okay, I should put rock here. If I write it this way, is that comprehensible to you or is it just <coughs> And here I will have uh, some Laplace. So do you <coughs> recognize that this for any compressible fluid is the assumed that you are you familiar with that or this notation is obscure? And this thing is just graphy. Well you, you can do the exercise. I mean it's just a different way of writing the same equation. Since in this theory there are a lot of tensors, normally the component notation is much more uh, comfortable. And if you start writing vector, then you have triple vectors. But all I want to say, this form is very important. It plays really the central role in the theory. So I would make, like to make sure that when you see this, you recognize that it's toxic. Advection, pressure, plus there is a piece, which is a dissipation. But these two different components have a very different physical meaning. These come from the equilibrium distribution. I will tell you what the equilibrium is. And this comes from out of the just freeze it for the time being, and we'll go back into that. I have just a notation on water. I just want to make sure that you recognize that it's toxic to this respect. Okay? So the momentum flux tensor contains both advection and pressure, and also contains dissipation. This is not trivial. I'm not going to show you uh, this uh, in this slide, just keep it for the the only point I want to make is that in order to go from the Boolean automaton to the fluid dynamic theory, you have to transit 
looking at the theory. And as I said before, to them, this is a 40-page paper where everything is there. It's a beautiful paper. Very thorough. It kills you, but there is really all you need. And they wrote down this equation. I don't think they even gave a name to it <coughs> because they really wanted to simulate the problem. But the lattice boson equation was written basically in 86, just not written as. Okay, this is the. There is a second crucial point that was really the key that not only you have to conserve mass, momentum, and energy, but you have to make sure that you have rotation of invariance. This was the toughest cookie, actually. Not into the diagram. If you take this expression, you know that if you rotate the frame by any angle, the, sh the form of this tensor will stay the same. Okay? That's because any space direction is equivalent. And you have to make sure that when you go in the lattice, where this object is supposed to be generated by this summation, the equilibrium distribution function times the CIA, CIB, this dynamic structure, when you expand this equilibrium, again, I have to anticipate a number of things, but I just wanted to give you the facts. You will see that in order for this to be true, you have to require that the fourth order tensors out of your lattice obey this property. So these fourth order tensors have to be isotopic. And that does not happen for just any lattice. Actually, in 2D is not difficult. In 3D, there is no lattice. That's crystal, crystallographical self truth, but people found ways out. <coughs> so, again, the point is that in order to have rotational isotopy, you have to have a structure which has some form of minimal symmetry. You have to cheat on the particles. In computational physics, you always cheat. You have to cheat in an honest way, you have to cheat nevertheless. So, particles should believe that they live in a world which is spherical, but you put them in a cage. Because if you don't put them in a cage, then you're back to Newton and you cannot solve cheating. The cage has to be gentle enough that this tensor would just not recognize it. If Navier-Stokes would depend on UA, UB, UC, UD, on the fourth order tensor, okay, in the, in the velocity, you would need something much more complicated. No way out, no free lunch. Happily enough, fluid dynamics is gentle. I mean, it doesn't have too much of a requirement for isotropy. And with this hexagon, in fact, they realized in 86 that the hexagon has enough symmetry to fulfill this, uh, this uh, equation. Again, there is a nice story here. People played with lattice gas long before pressure particles. And I put you the picture of many years ago, let's say, of Yves Pomo, because he's the invariant here. This is how he passed this Pomo in 76, and they were using a square lattice to play around, not really to do fluids. And FHP is free, has like a Pomo, so he did the last piece the same, and this is uh, Yves Pomo. When I started with these things, when I was in IBM, I just couldn't believe. You always have to question that changing from year to year could make any significant difference. So I played, I wrote down a lattice gas automaton in this square lattice, and what I got was square volumes, which is, I got vortices, but the vortices were squares. <laughs> so eventually they would move and do fancy things, but this was really wallpaper, okay? This little add-on, you just move from a fourfold symmetry to a six-fold symmetry, changes your life. Here you can do fluid that's serious for dynamics. This is not fluid dynamics at all. In insight, I would say for those of you who have been trained in numerics, it is not that surprising. If you try to write a Laplace operator with this in a finite different scheme and use this tensor, it will not be isotopic. If you do a Laplace operator, write a Laplace operator with this, it could be isotopic. And I have another an, an, an historical analysis for you. Back in 1989, I think I was just talking with that, there was a conference and Yves Pomo was there and he showed his notebook on the transparency with, uh, there was just one page, there was an hexagon, an arrow, sorry, there was a square, an arrow, and an hexagon, and it was written upstairs, su su suggestion, suggestion, are you at? 
suggestion to URL free, which to me means a lot. <laughs> and from there on, I mean, uh, the, the whole game started. But I mean, this uh, little observation was really crucial. And I can promise that this paper really sent huge waves. I mean, there was an article in the Washington Post saying, from now on, we will crack turbulence, fluid dynamics will be done in a different I mean, people were really very, I mean, there are reasons to be excited about that. Because you could compute turbulence using Boolean algebra. We are all familiar with round off errors, right? I mean, Boolean algebra, you don't make any error. Zero, zero, one, one. So it would be a way of computing which is completely revolution. It was really revolution. By that means. So uh, I think Frisch was the main propeller. They were really very, very excited, extremely excited. Unfortunately, things didn't turn out that simply, but <coughs> I was. Now, uh, I will stop a little bit. Because this is the heaviest part, so don't be scared. But before I go into that, I would like to make sure that everything I've been saying so far is, is clear. Yeah, AB, ABC, uh, it's a good plan. It's just a script, a script for X, Y, Z. If I tell you, the notation is this. If I write U, velocity vector, it's just writing like this. It's UX, UY, UZ. Okay? So if I write PAB, pressure tensor, I'm writing PXX, PXY, PZ, and so on. Sometimes you can call this EP, but as you go into the math, you will generate a tensor order 3, 4, and that's really very ugly notation. You get one. The coordinates are ugly as well. Everything is ugly when it gets complicated, but it's much more natural. So this is probably the toughest slide I have in the full course, so are you prepared for that? Yes. I want to get to the very last point, how to get from uh, lattice gas to fluid. There are several steps. The first step, you need a Taylor expansion because you are in the lattice. And in the lattice, this is a discrete equation. It's a finite difference equation. Mm -hmm. We should get that up here as well. So the particle will go from x to x plus delta x, where delta x is c delta t. Okay? There is a delta t missing here. I apologize. So you Taylor expand this because you want to recover a continuum. So here, here you have space-time discreteness. You tailor it from the left hand side. And what you get is a so-called semi-discrete equation because here time is continuous. Again, to make sure we understand each other on the, on the notation, when two indices are uh, contracted like this, I'm summing all the, uh, the usual Einstein connection. So this you could write in vector notation as ci grad f, okay? So this is the scalar product of the discrete vector c with the gradient in space, t dx, as applied to the distribution function. And this is the equation. Now, I, I'm sorry, here is mathematics is unavoidable. If I want to get the fluid equation, what do I do? I sum up over all possible speeds. Why don't I do that one? Take some more time, but I think it's worth it. So the generating equation is this. Let's do just the first equation. I want to generate an equation for the density of my group. So I have to sum up over all possible directions. Okay? When I sum over this, then the t goes out. And I get this. No when I sum this term, dDA, which is the dDxA, <coughs> the gradient goes out, and I obtain CAFI. And when I sum over the collision, what do I get? I get zero because I told you that the mass is constant. Now, this, by definition, is the fluid density. And this, by definition, is the current density. It's sometimes it's called JEA, but in fact it's rho UA. So this is the continuity equation. Easy. Okay. Now, let me move.
move fast, do the very same thing, but slightly more complicated. Now you put the CI here, say CAB, okay? You just let go over the structure of okay? So here I generate the DDT for FC, which is a current density. And this is driven by the divergence of the next order tensor, which is what I call PAB, the momentum flux tensor. I still get zero because momentum is conserved. It's very mechanical. This will really not seem very fancy. But I have to go further. And I have to generate the evolution of the momentum. This object is really key. That's really key. The time derivative of the momentum flux tensor will be driven by the divergence of a third order tensor. Do not bother with this. It will be connected to the energy flux tensor. The important thing is that on the right hand side, I don't get zero anymore. Why? Well, because there is no law in the microscopic world which tells me that this tensor, VV, is conserved in a collision. Energy is conserved, the trace of the tensor is conserved, but VV itself is basically destroyed by collision. Okay? And so here I put the placeholder, which is basically an eigenvalue, it will be a frequency actually, it will be a dimension frequency. And essentially, this is a simplification, this frequency will tell me, in fact, will multiply the departure of the momentum flux tensor from the equilibrium is the different function. Okay? So when I am at equilibrium, it will be zero, but in general it is not because the, there is no conservation law behind it. So as you see, I generate the air with the zero zone moment is driven by the first, the first is driven by the second, the second is driven by the third is an endically the sheet in general. So it never stops. At some point I have to close this hierarchy because the Boltzmann equation itself is just like an infinite dimension of partial differential equation. It generates an infinite quantity of these are called sometimes kinetic moments. Moment zero, moment one, moment two, moment three, and they are all connected in an infinite hierarchy, as it is always the case in statistics. So that if you take trace of the solid equation, yes. A for B, so you obtain quadratic equations. Yes. That's right. Okay. If you have enough symmetry. Yes. But the point I want to make here is that for the student, I mean, forget about the algebra, that at some point there is no way of deriving the Navier Stokes equation exactly. No way. You have to make what people call closure. An educated <coughs> guess on the physics of the system. An educated guess, very important, take a message, that you have to be close to local equilibrium. Local equilibrium means Maxwell distribution. So we will spend more time on that. But this is a theory which is supposed to reproduce more, uh, fluid dynamics, and fluid dynamics only holds when molecules are close to a maximum distribution. We have seen that in chemical theory. Are you familiar with that? Otherwise, we can spend a lot of time. But right hand side of the equation is the uh, uh, assumption. Right inside this is a sort of some some point I, I have not justified that. Mm -hmm. I mean this it can only be uh, shown rigorously if I take a specific expression for the expression, which I've not been mentioned so far. But the point I want to make is more I mean is more I want to make sure that we understand each other when I talk equilibrium and when I put it. I think I should spend time with that. So let me go straight to the end, but then I, I come back to this point because it's really crucial. The assumption by which you close and derive the Navier-Stokes equation is that your system when you do is never too far from the Maxwell distribution in velocity. Okay? And if this, let me go through the math and then I go back to the essence. If this is the case, what you do is the, you do the following. You say that the momentum flux tensor gets very rapidly to its equilibrium decays very rapidly with this equilibrium, and when it has decayed, it can kill the time rate. It's called sometimes adiabatic assumption or enslaved. If you are close to equilibrium, you say that the third order momentum, you can replace it by its equilibrium expression. And at this point, you can solve this equation, because if you kill this, P becomes P A equilibrium, 
plus one over lambda, just the one uh, lambda can be a diagonal term. And under this assumption, PAB, in fact, is, is expressed only in terms of equilibrium quantities, which I know how to compute because I know the equilibrium Only by doing that, when I take the momentum flux tensor like this, and I plug it back here, I finally get the structure of the Nordistor situation. This is purely formal. I will go back to the physics. I just want to show you, show you the mechanics. So by doing this assumption of the third order moment, I can solve for the momentum flux tensor in terms of the equilibrium quantities. I plug it back, and what I get is something which is looking like Nordistor. Did I prove that this is Nordistor? This so far is nice PD for the fluid velocity of the fluid current. These things are not because the equilibrium is not. So this is an evolution equation for the fluid uh, momentum. In order for this to be exactly in the stops, not just a joke around it, then I have to come to the formal requirements I told you before. The momentum flux tensor at equilibrium has to be this, nothing else. If it's not this, it will not be in the nice. And there is a requirement also of the third order, but I don't want to bother with too much else. So this has to be true in the lattice. That's the game. That's the thing you have to secure. And you have to find lattices which provide you with this symmetry. Otherwise, they will not work. And that's exactly what people did. So there are two elements. One is an element of symmetry and conservation, which really aims on the equilibrium. The second argument is more physical, but they are both physical, and it has to do with the closure of this mathematical machinery, which would lead you to an infinite hierarchy. And I really care more about closure, so let me spend some time on equilibrium on Forget about the lattice, and we know that in kinetic theory, you can always affect, you can split a distribution function between a equilibrium quantity and a non -equilibrium. If you are to reproduce hydrodynamics, this quantity has to be much smaller than this. What is non equilibrium? We are in this room. Is there any macroscopic flow in this room? Not really. The velocity of the air in this room is basically. Does this mean that the molecules are just sitting idle doing nothing? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Yes? No. I'm sorry, you're in the first the last slide. Yeah. No. In fact, the reason why we don't experience any macroscopic flow is because we have as many molecules impinging this way as many impinging the other ways. But they move very fast. They move faster than a Ferrari in this way. And it's 300 kilometers a second. Okay. It's just because even the fluid velocity is just the average. This is the probability distribution of the molecular velocity. Okay. They are typically Gaussians, so much of distribution. The average of the Gaussian is the fluid flow, which can be zero. But in fact, there is a variance, which is the temperature. If you are in a hot room, it will move faster and faster. If you are in a cold room, this Gaussian will shrink. But in this room, then this, this velocity is typically 300 meters per second. This sounds good. Yeah. So the, the microscopic world is always now uh, moving. Yeah. But if you are at equilibrium, the distribution will be exactly a Gaussian distribution. Now, what happens? Suppose you have now, you are in a situation where here I have 300 Kelvin degrees, and here I have 310 Kelvin degrees. Or here I'm standing still, and here there is some fluid velocity, like say in a wet cell. Where flow, I have a wall. Here, the fluid is not moving, and here it's moving a certain wall speed. So if I have a local equilibrium here, and then my particle jumps, say, here, she will find a different velocity. So now I should have the picture. The second Maxwell, which would be centered about another velocity, say here. 
when the particle comes and finds another environment with a different speed, it has to adjust to the new local environment. Can, adjust, can the particle adjust instantly? No. What is the mechanism which brings the particle to the local equilibrium of the new position? Collisions take time. This time is the physics cost. Remember the little formula. The viscosity, velocity times the input path. I can also have velocity and input path in terms of time. And this is just the time between two subsequent collisions. If I could collide in no time, I would have an ideal world with no dissipation. Alas, this is impossible. The result is that the distribution function will somehow <coughs> suffer some deformation on the Maxwell shape. And this deformation, which I indicate here as a tutorial as a red line, will be some, somehow proportional to the gradient of the equilibrium. Right? If, my, if I have a fluid with zero velocity, constant temperature, everything will be in thermodynamic equilibrium, no transport, no viscosity. The viscosity <coughs> But in general, transport phenomena are such that there is a slight deviation <coughs> of the local shape, and this slight deviation is responsible for uh, this particular. So everything falls now back in place because mathematically this is reflected by this object. This is advection diffusion, this is purely Newtonian feature. Back and they under, under the pressure forces, there is no dissipation. Dissipation is here, and this eigenvalue is basically related to the collisions. It's a formal way of putting that because it's very hard to do a calculation, but the physical essence is quite clear. I would like to underline another important thing that the Maxwell distribution is characterized by the density, which is the area underneath. Bell curve, the average, which is the full velocity, and the temperature, <coughs> these parameters can be space time dependent. Very often people think, I have been asked many times that, that if you have a turbulent fluid where this space time dependence is wild, particles should be just departing from us. It's just the other way around. It looks like it. Yeah, and just so, Pedro, we assume that we departure from local equilibrium. That's so right. time scale for reaching to equilibrium is quite short compared to the time scale here. That's right. Yeah. And then under that assumption, we can construct the isotropy of the fluid, and then we can construct the dialectic situation. Right. Well, why do you mention isotropy? I mean, the sense I was... Yeah, kind of, a, you know, yeah. under this assumption, we yeah. can construct the isotropy. And then reverse it was Under this assumption, we, we can construct isotropy of tensors. Then previously, that isotropy is quite important. Under this assumption, you boil down both an equation into an equation which has a, a, no. a, a, equation which has a, a first order convective part and a momentum diffusivity which is represented by second order. The plus okay, which is the situation. They both have to have isotropy. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, what do you mean by reverse? I mean, if just we we know the Navier-Stokes the equation constructed from the uh, isotropy uh, assumption, and then if it is isotropy, we can say no, 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 no. It's not the same. I mean, there are two terms. Let me see. The isotropy requirement is a symmetry requirement which has to apply both to equilibrium and non-equilibrium structures. Okay. Um, the constraints on the non-equilibrium are in fact tough. Okay. But <coughs> the fact that you say that you are just talking, a situa discussing a situation where the departure is small, um, it's really irrelevant <coughs> to the fact that there is a fluid description underneath. Let, let me be more clear. 
if you do plasma physics, right, some very often you are confronted with a situation, we have, say, an electric <coughs> field in your electron. Very often you end up in a situation where the electrons do like that. You generate so called runaway electrons. Okay? You don't describe this binary stuff. Because F non equilibrium here takes the prime <coughs> share. It swallows an F equilibrium. There is no any stuff for that. There would be maybe a very high order partial differential equation which nobody wants to write and read or use. Sometimes it's called Burnett, Super Burnett. There have been attempts to go beyond the stuff. Fourth order derivative, sixth order derivative. It's a jungle, it's a nightmare because uh, for many reasons. First of all, very often these equations are unstable on basic principles. Second, even if they are stable, you don't know what boundary condition to use. Okay? So, in a way, Navier-Stokes is very robust. Going beyond Navier-Stokes leads you to a, to a swamp. So either you, I mean, go to the full Boltzmann, which is just having an infinite dimension of functional differential equation. You better stay with navier -Stokes. Because the ground in between is very, very festive. Okay. Um, but this looks uh, the equation is very planar <coughs> isotropic. Uh, no, I mean, planar is <coughs> Why do you need iso isotropy? No, no, no. is a very yes. simple thing. I'm talking isotropy to the lattice. Yes. 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 Ah, I yes. mean, I can have a ferrodominated fluid, which is mm -hmm. not very strong. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Now I'm talking simple fluid. If we then I would need structure where in fact the I mean which is no longer isotropic. Okay? But this splitting between equilibrium and equilibrium and the requirement in the non-equilibrium be small with respect to equilibrium, this is fluid dynamics. Kinetic theory only recovers fluid dynamics by respect to dynamics if this is true. This by the way, this number as a name is called Knudsen number. And you can show that it is basically uh, it is basically the ratio of the mean free path versus the length of your macroscopic problem. So it means that by the time a molecule is traversing the car, it, it has to collide a lot. Okay? It has to do many, many collisions. So the mean free path has to be much, much smaller than any macroscopic length in the system because otherwise, as I said before, you have a free streaming of particles and you never equilibrate. That's what Boltzmann called the, I don't remember the word in German, the uh, ever shifting battle. There's a word in German I forget. It's always a battle. The battle is between the streaming, which takes you out of the collision, and the collision, which wants just to bring you back. So I'm velocity zero here, and here is velocity one. When I move, I'm out of equilibrium here because I'm coming from a different environment. And that collision works to thermalize me on the new position. This ever shifting battle is the rule, uh, is the basic mechanism behind this equation. <coughs> but if this is weak, you never collide, this thing will dominate and then you have a ratified gas and then you need the Boltzmann equation. Because there is no other dynamics. The isotropy requirement I was referring to is the symmetry requirements which are needed in the lattice in order for this tensor to take the right shape. So it's a structural requirement. Okay. I hope this clarifies a little bit. Uh, how are you doing? Do you want, do you want to keep going or do you want to keep going? If you don't mind, I can keep going. This part is a little bit boring. Please, if there is any obscurity. If not, I think we can take it a little bit, a little bit easier. No math. Now, a few weird things happen. Back to the lattice now. So, we have a beautiful Maxwell distribution. Okay. So, what do I have to do to construct lattices? Just take B, the velocity, and put the discrete velocity of my of the lattice I show. Yeah, so. No way. If you do that, failure again. The thing is beautiful because it's, it's literally with catches. C 
simple move that would be allowed to do would not work. And again, the reason is more than technical, it's rather profound. It has to do with Galileo effect. And the Boltzmann distribution, as you see, it depends. Replace this Ci with V, the velocity of the, of the fluid. The Maxwell distribution does not depend on the absolute velocity of the molecule, it depends on the relative velocity relative to the fluid. Let's get it into that. So if you move the frame at the speed u, the physics stays the same. And take the temperature constant. Now, if you take this expression, uh, this should hold through for any velocity. Okay? But if you try to fulfill the equalities I showed you before, see if I, this one, by replacing the Maxwell distribution with V equals CI, it just breaks your nose. I mean, mathematics will tell you no, no, no way. Why? Because. So the best you can do, in fact, is what we can do. Okay, okay. I will expand the maximum about with zero velocity, and this number is, in fact, u over c sound and v thermally I, is the same thing in this group. There, are, there is no potential energy. So you expand it at uh, low Mach, and what you get is an expression which is constant plus a linear term in u plus a quadratic. And people realize that term by term, in fact, if I replace this expression with this second order expansion, then I can match the same. What does that mean? It means that my lattice fluid has to be slow. If it moves at an arbitrary velocity, I will need, in fact, an infinite series, always the same code. You see tensor appearing here. Remember that I have to do Fi equilibrium Cc. And now you see why I get forces. Because two I get from the expansion, and two I get when I contract to get the pressure moment. There is always this value. So at this order, I will need tensor of order four. If I want to go further, because my fluid is moving fast, I will need U, 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 C, 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 which makes C power six tensor. Now you start to feel what <coughs> the game looks like. So I can do whatever I want with the lattice, so long as the lattice has enough symmetry to recover the <coughs> equation I need in the continuum. This is the reason why the lattice both usually is confined to nearly incompressible flows. That's the reason. Because you have to expand and you want your mind number to be small. Again, it makes perfect sense heuristically. I told you that we are cheating. Okay. <coughs> we use a lattice like this, in fact we can use this by similar, and the fluid has to be lived at this in a cycle. It is quite clear that if the fluid is moving slowly, you will not see much around it. You will not probe some of the space-time structure. But if the, move, the fluid starts to move fast, which is on a single time step, the fluid, not the particle, move on a single lattice step, it will see that the axiom is not a sphere. So a fast flow is much more demanding. You see, it sees better, it just wears better glasses. Okay? So that's precisely the trick. So, well, I already tell, told you the story, you can formalize it, you know that. There is a nice expression in mathematics that this is the generating function of the new polynomial, and if you go from the global equilibrium to the local, the transformation involves powers of the velocity at any order, and the coefficients and their new polynomial tensor or the So if you want to model a fluid which is moving fast, you have to take many terms into account, and you have tensor which are blown up. I can tell you it's almost a Today we can do lattices like the one you saw in the here. This is a very simple lattice. This has 18, it's a typical lattice we use in 3D. It has 18 spaces. 
if you want to have tensor of order 6, you should double this. And you will get 36, and so on and so forth. That's not a big deal in the bulk, but out of our hundred. <coughs> so higher order lattices, now people are developing pretty fast in frequency, but the boundary conditions are always much. So describing fast fluids with lattice balls, no, is not this. They're asking for supersonic, no, not really super, transonic, et cetera, but they are much less robust. So lattice ball can is born, basically, for uh, nearly to the best of Everything's clear? Prices to pay, right? What do I lose by going from year to year? Well, first of all, I have to be slow. And if I'm not slow, I didn't break heavily on the real, so-called realized division. There. This is the distribution function. It is supposed to be positive. This is positive by definition. You can push you as far as you want. You will never make it negative. But by the time I expand, I will get this. These are three typical lattice equilibrium. So if I have a, if I have a the fluid here is moving rightwards. If I am a particle moving rightwards, I will be promoted. The particles move along the flow are more populated. They have a bounce. Okay? The opposer, so to say, get a penalty. So the counter-moving particle will be depleted. And if I insist that the fluid goes over the lattice units, basically over 5.2, it will become negative. In fact, and it's still true, most lattice balls on coast go here. My velocity in the lattice unit should be 0.1, which means that particles in a single time step go from one side to another, but the fluid overall it must take at least 10 time steps to move from one side. If you want to push the fluid moving in one step from one lattice side to another, you've seen that. Sure. If you run a lattice ball from code, your code will crash as soon as the local velocity is uh, 0.1.2. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so with this, I will close and stop in a bit with this because I see that my voice is. Just as a summary, the lattice gas was very exciting because exact computing, Boolean algebra, occupation number, no round off error. The dynamic is simple. This simple is looks deceiving, but what I showed you so far is simple. In three dimensions, it's not simple at all. <coughs> It is very good for parallel computing because most of the work is done, is done side by side, so there is no communication. And it is, so the communication to computation is very favorable. And the information moves along straight lines. This is a key. This is still true for uh, lattice balls. <coughs> in Levi Stokes, as I wrote before, you always add u grad u, right? Figure means I move my momentum along the trajectory which is given by the momentum itself. And if my fluid is turbulent, this trajectory will be wide. But the Boltzmann or kinetic theorem does not do that. You always move along V, V does not determine the space and time, and that is Boltzmann V is a straight line. This is an enormous advantage. And this is really inherited. So Lattice Boltzmann broke this point because we lost exact computing. But all the rest is still with us at the time. <coughs> Frisch et al. were most excited about this because this was a revolution. Lattice Boltzmann is not a revolution. But because this is false, the lattice gas failed. And I'll tell you why. Just very quickly. But all the rest stays with us. And this is key. This is a really key asset for that as well. Move information along straight lines is the asset for that as well. 
and this really we owe to the lattice gas. Now, why is the lattice gas even fly from the lattice? Many reasons, but in general, people believe it is because you don't really get exactly the Navistox, you get Navistox with some corrections, and people, I heard that many times, say, ah, the Navistox was almost correct. But it is not because of that. The real killer was complexity. I show you the real accident in the beginning, right? I promise you can write a collision operator for the accident in a matter of half of a day. Why am I? Because you have 2 to the power 6 configuration, and you will realize, with a little bit of care, that only 16 can collide. And you can write the Boolean operator I gave in my first time. Now, try to do the same this, and this is very really simple. And then what they did when they tried to go to 3D, they realized that there is no lattice in 3D having the isotropy property, which was dead. But these people are smart. So what they did, they didn't want to, theoretical physicists used to be pretty often. They went to 4D, they found one, and then they ran the 4D simulation in just the three dimensional slab. Very ingenious. The result is that in 4D, basically, you have these links, and you should think of the nearest nylon links, the blue ones, if you can see that, as being degenerate. They have velocity plus or minus one along the fourth direction. The total is 24. Now, what is the complexity of 20? How many configurations do we have with the 24 lattice? 2 to the power 24 means 16 megahertz. We are talking 20 years ago more than that. So at each lattice site, your collision would cost you of the order of 16 million operations, average site, average time step. Okay? So that is the reason that killed. Okay. The story is more complicated than that, but essentially, nowadays I think the, the reason why one of the reason why I still keep the lattice value, not only because it's culturally not is because it might come back. In those days, it was killed by the complexity. You cannot afford 16 million of the I mean, people were really lucky. Then, Enon, Frisch, etc., they are so smart. They invented ways of producing this information still. Then the problem you mentioned at the beginning, the low range was a killer. Not enough provisions. <coughs> Myself, I started from a different path. I was in IBM. I ran the six dimensional pump. I got turbulence. It was my first PRL, very happy. And I even, those beautiful days, IBM would even pay you a prize for that, mm -hmm. some money. Okay. But the day after, when I told my boss that this costed me about two orders of magnitude more than a spectral code, he said, very nice, please do something else. <laughs> <laughs> and that something else, big luck, was not this boat. No? Thanks to every kind of story in the next lecture. But essentially, when you run the rapid gas, since it's Boolean, you cannot just track a Boolean part. You have to average. And it took really a lot of average before you could extract the smooth signal. Whereas in lattice Boltzmann is smooth by definition. So that was the reason. Lattice Boltzmann was invented. The first lattice Boltzmann was proposed by Mecca in 1888 in Chicago just to beat this part. This was just, that was not the most important thing. The real killer was this. Okay, with that, I think I'm ready to the, well, almost, I, all the rest is pictures, so you can take it very, very easy. Feynman itself, this is a connection machine. I don't know that. You know the story about Feynman? <laughs> he was working in Boston for this uh, Thinking Machine Corporation. And they hired him as a consultant. Okay. And then he said, no, 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 I don't want to be a consultant. Give me something concrete. <laughs> then said, well, we need some pencil. <laughs> and they sent, they sent him to buy some pencil and stationery, and he went to do that. Just an uh, interesting anecdote. So by the way, he was very interested in the things in was just the last year of his life. And this is one of the very first largest gas uh, calculations flow past the sphere, there's no way that you can see this from Carmen's API. It's very primitive. 
as a fluid dynamic engineer, you'd say so. Please give me a break. Don't do anything that. But conceptually, it was really important. So the physicists got excited. But taking this from this level to the level of fluid dynamics, like designing cars, this company is doing these days, they really hold the market of external aerodynamics. That was a long gap. No way you can do that. You know, very expensive. But if you wanted to fluctuate in hydrodynamics in bio and brain and stuff like that, I said, well, that was just to still be an option. So people were obsessed with turbulence, or fridge. Uh, uh, they really wanted to crack that problem. But if you enlarge your picture, I think there would be still room for for, uh, for all these gaps. Okay, so I think it's good to to be aware of. So, and at this point, I think this should have been enough of my lecture, but I should go to take longer. The next, the, this lecture is ending now. Soon, and then it's what, by noon? Which is now, 10 minutes. Okay, rather than starting with the LD saga, which uh, it's not very long, but I will tell you, in fact, the various families of writers, most of fish, which are used today. I mean, everybody's using it. You're using it, I'm pretty sure. Right. You should. I'm good. Everybody's using a uh, version of Lattice Boltzmann, which is not the best one. It's really the same. So I think it's, it's nice for you to know the story. Perhaps I can begin with the story. Because I really told you. So in the early days, people wanted to kill the noise problem. So just the noise in the big city. So Zanetta and Nakamara, Kadam as well, as you can see in the early years. Uh, they said, oh, fine, you showed us that there is a Boltzmann equation in between. And they made a really very sharp observation. How about we use this equation that you wrote down to do simulation, not just as a intermediate steps to learn other stuff. The boring stuff I showed you before was just to show the same thing. The Boolean automata will produce an Aristotle's equation. Why don't we use this equation as a computational tool? They, so they did not discover that uh, as well. So they, how would you say, when you find something which is already there but people don't realize it, it must be a Now, let me do a check on that this point. So, so, we have four keywords for the lattice steps. Basically, there is no check because I already told you. They just lifted point number one. Because by replacing the Boolean number with probabilities, they pre average, as people say. F is already an average. So, there is no need of the simulation will be smooth. All the rest is totally untouched. It is as complex as electric gas because there are as many correlations here as in the real correct. This is not Boolean, so what? It's 2 to the power 24 floating point operation. You don't want to do that. In fact, they only ran a two dimensional simple flow. And again, no higher Reynolds number because there are no. There is not a single collision here which is possible unless it is already in the lattice gas. And the lattice gas has few collisions. So this thing is just really a pre average automata. That's what it is. So they showed that the viscosity is a bad viscosity, but this is useless from the point of view of real fluid analysis. Incidentally, this is a deductible. There is a big crime. You see what the crime is? What big crime? It's the same crime committed by both, by the way. <laughs> if I have an operator, <coughs> it's this, the answer is already there. Remember the lattice gas. Sometimes I use this shortened. N F means N at X plus C sub I, T plus 1. It's just too long and then basic. So the lattice gas goes like this, C I of N. And this is the 
polynomial operator with application number. What they do, they just do the same. And please, f is average of n equals ci of n. Which means that they say ci of n equal average of ci of n. What is the kind? Well, you swap the averaging and the operator. This is nonlinear operator. I cannot, okay, if I have, if I, have, I can write it like this, n is equal f plus a fluctuation, okay? This is zero, one, these are two, n squared, I'm very sorry, it's f squared plus f theta squared plus two, f theta. When I average, this goes because f tilde is zero, right? <coughs> the variance doesn't go. So when I average a linear operator, I can just take it. It's just like doing mean field theory here. Which is the very statistical case. So, but this is exactly what both mean do in, in, in theory. So it's a molecular chaos assumption. You assume that there are no correlations between the particles when they enter a correlation. So this is nothing worse than standard human theory. The problems are with the yeah, that's what it is. Then comes a real, and I was really very lucky in my life because you know, I owe to Francisco Guerra, he visited me in 89. I was still fighting to get my PLL published in the Latin class. He walked into my office and he said, I have something else for you. <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm, I'm kind of German Italian. I want to get my job done before I switch to something else. But I'm happy that I hid it at this advice. This is a bit too long, so let me tell you just the bottom line, and then we will start to talk more. But essentially, let me give the, the, the achievement. They realized, that again, exploiting the fact that we only want to do near equilibrium slow flows, <coughs> this complicated collision operator could be expanded around zero velocity equilibrium. There is a double expansion. This is the <coughs> zero velocity equilibrium. This is the part of the equilibrium which depends on the velocity. And this is the non equilibrium. So it's a double expansion. By working out the analytics, which is not complicated, but nevertheless, they could show that the nasty collision operator CI could be written in the form, beautiful form, in collision matrix, which is the effect of population I and population J times the departure from the equilibrium. This is a different world. Computation is and most important, this was really the uh, ingenious part. I'm not going to give you the details. This collision matrix can be evaluated at the global equilibrium. So this is a constant matrix. People would not expect that. Beautiful world, extremely beautiful world, very ingenious. So they could boil down the complicated 2 to the power 24 into something which is 24 power 2. Makes a big difference. The fact is even less than that because it's plenty of symmetries. So this made the scheme viable. But, so I, I even made some mistake because I declared in public years ago, and people are sensitive about it, but this to be a major breakthrough in the theory. I still believe it is. <laughs> But some people get offended when I see that. But really, Francisco Guerra, for some reason, he came and quit immediately, but he really made a couple of outstanding contributions. And, um, but again, if he fell short, I have to go back to this. Year. So now we remove the killer. But still, a numerical engineer, professional, will not be impressed because, again, you cannot do are uh, you kind of the turbulence. Why? It's the very same thing. Look here. This collision matrix is kind of Jacobian of the Boolean operator. I mean, there is some answer there. I, I would spare you here. So again, there is not a single collision allowed by this operator that would not be linked to the underlying lattice gapper. So there is still this umbilical core between the two worlds, okay? 
that is my move, but still no range. No way you can compete. Then come the tricky elements, and we just broke the umbilical <laughs> cord. But Francisco was definitely. I must again give credit. Basically, the idea, I definitely distinctly remember that day when Roberto Venti was my boss at that time. Roberto is an extremely good scientist, best known for, he's the inventor of stochastic resonance. And the very pleasant person. So I came in and said, guys, since you didn't know anything about that, since you're trying to do Mary Stokes and you have this methods, why don't you design the methods in such a way that you get a Stokes and you forget about all this cohesion, etc. Of course, it was just a suggestion. We didn't work through the detail. And then Francisco was basically, again, we worked out the detail. And I shouldn't say that, but I think it's objective. This is also that problem. Because we just turned it upside down. We wrote down this equation. Forget about the force. We'll talk about that. This looks like a Gary method. You cannot see any difference. The little difference is that AIJ is you play it. You don't derive from the right steps. You design it. And the requirements, again, I moved it very fast because there is some mathematics. But the requirements are again those are again conservation. So you design the matrix through its eigenvalues, one they are called omega, they are called lambda. And you know by mathematics there is a nice uh, theorem called the spectral theorem. If you know the eigenvalues of your operator and, and the eigen vectors, you can construct a matrix like this. So we just design so that some of these eigenvalues were zero for the conservation, and the first non-zero was dissipation. And we just plug the number in the code for the dissipation. So this has all of the, in fact, all the collision you want to achieve. Because you tune the viscosity to the value you, you want to describe. Because this is the big attack. In practice, this allows you to do, in fact, we ran the flow past the ceiling, and that makes confidence for the analysis. That was really competitive. Okay? More than that, I would say, 20 years down the line, the very idea of design Marcus Boltzmann from a macroscopic target proved really very, very useful. People did that for many other applications. You start from the target, and you design the underlying Marcus Boltzmann. That's very powerful. Now we do that for many things, <coughs> including quantum equations. So it's really a very powerful part. There is a price to pay for that as well, but let me keep up to the simple stuff. I just want you to appreciate the change in the shift in the, the logic. Okay? At this point, we break the contact with the underlying lattice gas, and I can anticipate, and I did not realize that at all, that we were losing something. We're losing, in fact, the uh, link with the second principle. I will talk about that tomorrow. But this was chance. This uh, failure was for you. For reason, it's just chance. And none of us had the slightest clue. This scheme could have failed miserably on account of stability. It didn't because of very favorable aspect which I will comment about tomorrow. He could have failed miserably. The new Baptist Boltzmann story can be basically quenched at this point. Last point, one point. What everybody is using today. And then again I give him historical. I'm old enough to give historical remarks, so you see that? <laughs> uh, well we were younger though. Uh, uh, then came these people, Kellner, totally forgotten, was the first one, but he left the field and then he got one forgotten. Chan Chan Matal's newspaper is very well respected, and Ken Rimer is possibly the most cited paper in the field, deservedly so. They showed two things. First of all, they gave the expression of the equilibria I showed you before, the one with the expansion, which was not known. People were doing much more complicated things, so they gave a systematic very useful. Second, they realize that since we are only talking viscosity of this type of fluids, why should we bother about the matrix? Why don't we just choose a constant? And 
it's very easy to show tau is just the inverse of omega, that this curve is given by this simple form. This is called BGK because it's just a lattice analog of the model both notation by Batman, Gad, Ross, and Crook. This is called lattice with ZK, and everybody loves it because it's a piece of cake. I remember. <laughs> I don't get this question now for a few years. But for at least more than 10, 10 years, people ask me, are you really solving many stocks? <laughs> yes. And sometimes we solve it much more efficiently. Yeah. People do, do not do that. But by now there are, I don't know, if you, if you Google what is most known in the more than one million entries, but and many, many thousands of papers. But I mean, people don't, didn't believe that this is the stuff. It is. And even though I saw this equation for so long, each time I see it, I really like it because it's, it's so beautiful and narrow. Advection and all the nonlinearities. New gradu is hidden in a much more beautiful structure. The streaming is linear, no new gradu. Just shift particle is stream, not advection. Advection to me means that when the fluid moves along its own trajectory, streaming when you go blindly along the straight line. And the nonlinearity <coughs> is local. Everything is written at equilibrium, but this is local, xt, xt. So this structure is beautiful. Beautiful mathematically is very efficient, and you can call it, you know, like now you're doing more complicated problems because you need particles. This is, I have a warm up call, I can show it, usually I show it when I give uh, long courses. You can call that in counter lattice. So, this is the famous lattice with K, and it's by far the most popular. Uh, I sometimes am a little bit sad that people forgot about uh, the fact that the lattice Boltzmann was born in Macri's form, and now this Macri's form is, has been revived under a different name, which sometimes disturbs me a bit. But I don't understand why. But then another note is that in inside, I mean, our paper is pretty more cycle, but Kelvin there is more cycle. And I tell myself how silly we have been not to realize that. <laughs> but you know, it's an interesting story because everybody has been silly. <laughs> this smart and silly at the same time. This time. Because they, well, probably they realized that. This was not a working tool, but they abandoned it. They just made this paper and quit. And there was just a big golden, uh, I'd say, nugget waiting for them. They just didn't push it. Uh, Higuero was mad because he was going, uh, he was proposing this, and he was still pretty much active in this. But none of us had realized that since we were just discussing this cross, why? using a full matrix. And this is also a sociological aspect. I mean, coding this is not that much more cumbersome than coding the UK. It's, but people don't do that. Obviously, but why should they code the matrix when they have just a single file? So it's what the ease of use. So the message for the young is that when you think that something is just too simple to be interesting, Please think again, because people really love to use simple things if they work. Don't never underestimate one of your findings if you feel that it is too simple. Okay? So simple things become very popular if they work. So um, having said that, I think no, no, Chapman Eston, that 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 you would kill me. Uh, the rigorous people, for instance. Here I give this in passing. This thing is extremely important. It looks like an innocent ship. This, without this ship, you would not be able to do this. But I will tell you that more. You can get this correction to the viscosity only if you do the proper job. And the proper job is pretty famous. This is a kind of punishment. It's uh, you have to do the expansion, not only the distribution, but also the operators, <coughs> and do all the matchings. And by the time you're done, you realize that. Over zero, yeah. Ideal ergodynamics, either. 
this epsilon is basically the Hinsa number that was mentioned before. <coughs> and if you go on, Aristotle, you go right first of all, but there is a lot of, there is a lot of algebra. And this was in the early paper by Frisch. Uh, and then you finish. Okay, if, if my time, no, I'm already over board, so I will stop here. Tomorrow, perhaps, we will start from here and then we will go to the next So, any outstanding question? Thank you for being totally nonsensical. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, you mentioned that you designed a matrix, and uh, what the structure is to wait to you to design? Because you mentioned that the matrix A you have to design, not, uh, not, uh, not to compute it. And how to design? Because of uh, is, uh, so many options to choose. And, uh, no, not many options. That was mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, Matrix has many single things. A J must be a function of C X plus C J, so the first principle is symmetric. Second, you can prove that uh, since you have mass <coughs> conservation, when you contract over I'm getting a little bit technical, that the the what the if I have, for instance, a lattice like this, six. the vector made up of all ones is an eigenvector and that has to have zero eigenvalue because this is mass conservation. I, mean, I, I really have to move fast, but when you do this operation, so you have to give the minus of j, this will be c sub i, right? When you sum over i, you have to get zero because this is mass conservation. This tells you that there is a zero eigenvalue, and the eigenvector is just this. I mean, I can I, I mean, I should show you. I mean, I cannot demonstrate this takes a lot. You can do the same with the vector c j x, c j y, c j z. So many eigenvectors you know beforehand by the conservation laws, and the eigenvalues are zero. Other eigenvector you can start with the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. And the eigenvalues you choose. So the first eigenvalue, the eigenvalue, sorry, the eigenvalue associated to this, ci, ci, the, the momentum flux tensor, this is also an eigenvalue. In fact, these are six. Because it will be ca, ca, b. In kinetic space, this is a list of eigenvector, and their eigenvalue is the first omega different from zero, and this is the discussion. So we close it. This we knew beforehand by the structure of the equation. So mass, momentum, momentum flux, you don't have to think. You know the angle And you also know the angle The rest, which we call ghost fields, because they are there, but you don't see them, then you have to somehow elaborate on them. But you can find them here. So we, we look pretty well. This is described as probably the best paper in this time in our own, the new Benjamin Switch in Agasawa 92. That paper is pretty well cited as well. And there you find all the deti details on how we design. So it was not difficult. It looked scary. Pardon? The matrix you looked scary at the end. No, what? Scary? What's scary? But so many different numbers. No, 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 no. But there is really a lot of structure into this matrix. I have to look for Well, already this. No, no, no. I mean, it's not scary at all. When you take this product, you realize that, again, we are in the lattice. This is. No, 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 no. You don't have to be scared. This is CI, CJ, cos theta, J, right? There are a few angles in the lattice. Just four or five. So the matrix has four, I don't remember, I think there are five. So, and, and then this, plus the symmetric, plus the, plus the other structure, I mean, we could work on the algebra really, but well, Massimo Vergasolo is now a very successful uh, scientist, was probably one of the best students I've ever seen, so he did the work very fast. He is an outlier, but I mean, 
less brilliant students would have done it maybe a longer time, but faster would be. So no, no, it does not scale. What do you think is the major advantage if you do actually keep the matrix formulation here? What, what, how much difference would you get in uh, hydrodynamics? That is my lecture tomorrow, but right. yeah. Uh, that's what I was mentioning before. Um, um, people have revived this scattering matrix and they call it uh, multi relaxation time because there are multiple eigenvalues. The advantage is there. I mean, how could I possibly work with a collision operator where all modes decay at the same rate? It means, for instance, mass, momentum, decay at the same rate, so I have only an ideal gas. If I want to have some heat transfer, the prime number of different Cauchemin, I cannot. More important, with one uh, relaxation time, there is no doubt to discuss it, and that uh, has effects on the numerical stability of the scheme. So people uh, reinvented the scattering matrix with some uh, optimization, and we can show that very often it is more stable. I'm a little bit nervous about that, not nervous, but I think the people who did that really oversold the, the argument. They really heavily attacked BGK more than it deserved, but indeed there is an advantage in this analysis, both in terms of having more physical latitude and also in terms of stability. I wouldn't say it is so crucial, but obviously not. BGK is obviously not the best latitude force. Not at all. That's because of the theory. It's limited to uh, uh, parameters of multiple lines, stability, and about this property, but it's very, very handy. So I was, in fact, reproached that being heavily responsible in all for this capturing approach, we turned to BGK ourselves immediately and picked from. Tell me, why did you do that? Because it was ended. I cannot see a really major divide between the two. But the scattering is right. below what the original solution would impose on it. Here the Reynolds number, I mean, here we are, can do the highest Reynolds number compatible with the visual resolution that we have. Because we choose it. It's something to do zero viscosity problems. And we try massive, of course. But we don't do zero viscosity, not because of that is small. We don't do zero viscosity because we have a grid like this, and we want to excite the wavelength is, you can do it. In fact, you can do it if you record as some turbulence model built in, which is what we found to that. But in the formally, before this, and you are limited to something like this, just because there were not enough collisions, so the recording is just much, much higher than the grid would have absorbed. So no, here there are no limitations in the range number, except for the grid Slightly confused. I mean, like in the Chapman Minskov expansion, you basically set it the zeroth order one recovers the Euler equation. Yes. So if one considers the incompressible limit, uh, I mean, like if I write down the Euler equation for the. Uh, Why should that be incompressible? No, I'm like, I'm assuming a uh, low Mach number and the G. Low Mach is one story, but not so much another story. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, in that limit, uh, Mach number going to zero. Ah, yes. Uh, so basically, I can approximate uh, uh, the physics, the, the the flow from what I get from the Euler equation to be isentropic. Yes. Uh, now, so uh, I'm I'm a little confused regarding the equilibrium because, for example, when you actually write down the first, the zeroth order equation in the Chapman curve expansion, there is no collision coming into the picture. You just have the equilibrium. 
So does yeah, it? Yeah, but, uh, but the equilibrium is the correction. So, so is, isn't it? I'm like, uh, can you actually say that uh, the the dynamics of the Euler equation are non-equilibrium in the sense? Oh, no, 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 in that way, then there, there, there is no there is no way to dissipate. For example, there is no way to clear the velocity gradient. Let's see. Okay, these things can be very tricky. Let me see if I can if I can simplify the picture and clarify. Let's write Boltzmann in BGK form. Right? I, we don't need to go into that. And let's write it visually. Sent tau to zero, which is zero viscosity, and forcing f, f into f equilibrium, right? That's the only thing. So that's when the collision are extremely strong and they dominate completely the dynamics of the system. So this is the Knudsen zero limit. There is no statement on, on Mach number. That's what I meant. So the, the that's a sort of paradox, I agree. The idea of this pure limit is the one where collisions are totally eliminated. One with the associated idea with no collision. No, because the collisions are conservative, so you don't dissipate anything in colliding. And the stronger they are, the faster you go to have to collision. The opposite limit, not so infinity, is the free streaming gas. Okay? Tau goes to infinity, and basically you propagate the initial condition. Infinite number. Nothing to do with the field. So the argument should be based on rather the mean free path than on the viscosity. This is the mean free path argument. Knudsen is the mean free path over some length. Or if you want mean free, if you want to be a little bit f over f, right? Mean free path times the gradient, this thing has to be very small. And here I should put some equilibrium. <coughs> so the two opposite, the opposite limit is where the streaming dominates, if you put some no equilibrium, collision don't matter, and you just propagate the initial condition forever. Not the fluid, nothing. The other opposite is kill the streaming because you go to collision are so strong that it takes you to equilibrium in all time. The, the, the Mach number is equal here, but there are subtleties when you take the incompressible limit because the two limits look and say no Mach interfere. And these things are messy and I'm not in much control of that. I don't think there is a rigorous derivation by the way. But at this level the picture is pretty clear. So Knudsen zero means a lot of collisions. A lot of collision means ideal Maxwell distribution. It means no dissipation. That's plenty. It's very counterintuitive. The, the problem is that the collision don't dissipate, they are conservative. 